Previously, I demonstrated how to create a sized image with the appropriate aspect ratio for uploading to Facebook and use as a cover photo in the timeline there. The reason one would prefer to have an image already converted to the aspect ratio Facebook uses is so that you can begin to build a series of images that will best represent your business or the clients you manage their social media for. You need to keep in mind, on the internet image content rules. People don't surf the net to find a copy of War and Peace to read on their computers. It's about pictures. This is one of my cover photos I made for the Phoenix Lightroom Enterprise Timeline. Here is the original image I exported from Lightroom, cropped to the 9 by 3.35 aspect ratio I had established there. You can see in the Layers panel here that I have a stacked series above the original exported image labeled as Background. These layers transform that photograph into a photo illustration I eventually uploaded to Facebook. Let's have a look at how this illustration was done. The first layer above background, our Lightroom export, is a photograph of a scratched up sheet of metal. I've reduced its opacity to 68% to achieve the look I was after for my illustration. To me, this simulates a sort of glass plate photograph that became damaged by carelessness, as if someone had thrown the glass negative into some old dusty shop drawer and simply forgot about it as they piled more and more junk on top of all the things stored there. I decided to use the overlay blending mode as this layer's treatment for affecting the image below. In this case, overlay provided the effect I was most satisfied with. And that's the thing about blending modes. Each blending mode available from this pop-up in the layers palette affects an image a bit differently than another. And each layer blending mode may work better in one illustration than on another composite image one may be working with at another time. The best advice I can offer for experimenting with blending modes is to simply take your time and experiment. I almost always utilize layer blending modes in the evolution of my work from original photograph into a photo illustration and I have found that explanations available in books and online about how each blending mode interacts with the layer or layers below it is helpful only as a sort of rule of thumb. If you want a brief but comprehensive online explanation of how blending modes work, this wiki page is quite helpful. But really, don't sweat it. I know it's important to save time, to get her done and all, but when creative work becomes drudgery, just another J-O-B, where we're constantly stressing over the time it takes to start and finish what we're doing, then it's time to quit that creative endeavor and start a lawn or pool service as a way to make a living instead. At least, you'll be getting fresh air and exercise. Learn the keyboard shortcuts for moving through the blending mode series. Shift, Option, Plus, or Minus if you're working on a Mac. Shift, Alt, Plus, or Minus if you're working on a PC. This way it takes only minutes to effortlessly cycle through the options, considering how each affects your work and well worth the time, considering the potential here for ending up with something remarkable for all your effort. Now that I've decided upon the most suitable blending mode effect in its opacity, I need to do a couple of things here before moving on to creating a bit of text in order to complete my illustration. Note what happens when I hold down the Command key on a Mac, the Control key on a PC, then click on the texture layer that is creating this scratched glass plate effect. See our little buddies? The marching ants is a sort of frame around our photo. Check this out. Our composite image file's dimensions is 900 by 335. However, the overlay texture I'm using is considerably larger than that, 1385 by 850. You can see the layer's hidden edges here inside the document window, our active workspace here in Photoshop, but only when the layer is selected. Even if I change the layer's blending mode back to normal at 100% opacity, we are only able to see the portion of this layer that is within our document's set dimensions. But the whole file is still there in its entirety, bloating the size of our layered illustration. Let's cut the fat and trim our file size considerably in the process. Select the Crop tool from the Tool Palette, or simply press the C key to make it active. Now click and drag from one corner diagonally to the far corner, press Return or Enter and you're done. I've nearly halved my initial file size from 12 megabytes down to nearly 7 megabytes instead. Next, with the texture layer still active, 
I shift select the background layer and then press the link icon at the bottom of the layers panel to link the two layers together. This will ensure that I do not inadvertently move my texture overlay out of registration. One last thing for me to do to complete this timeline cover photo illustration. I'm going to add some text. I think that choosing the right font face for text as a design element is one of the more important decisions you will be making in building your illustration. On a Mac, the task is a snap. I simply open the font book utility and as you can see here, I have already carved up a pretty sizable font collection into a series of subsets based upon specific uses of text in the work I do. Headline bold might work. Perhaps something from the group modern minimalist. But in the end, I've decided to work with the Distressed Text series, settling upon this font, Everyday Ghost. Without getting lost in the weeds here by way of an explanation, the long and short of my work with this unique font requires a certain amount of labor kerning between layers. Kerning is the adjustment of space between layers. It is a design layout process that could become the topic of an entire video all by itself. So, maybe some other time. To achieve the finished phrase, let's play as we see it now, took just a little bit of experimentation on my part. I didn't want the phrase to be in color. I chose to work with white for my type instead. The default normal blending mode for this type layer was just not what I had in mind here for my illustration. So again, by a process of elimination, I eventually settled on the overlay blend mode to better achieve the look I was after. But even at 100% opacity, there just wasn't enough presence to this element of my design. And there's just not enough snap to the scratchy, pencil-like formation of the letters that make up this phrase. I would need to add sharpening to my type for that. Now I know from past experience that my composite illustration workflow has me readjusting various settings throughout each project's evolution, returning again and again to tweak something like sharpening on one or several layers. I need to have the ability to update whatever effect I assign to something like this type element perhaps many times over in the process of my work. This requirement is a perfect reason for converting that type layer into a smart object. But keep in mind, once type is converted into a smart object, it is no longer editable. That means, for example, that if I want to tweak this phrase's complex kerning scheme or perhaps later experiment with some or all of the letters vertical or horizontal scaling or baseline shift, I'd be out of luck. So with the type layer active, I press Command J on my Mac, Control J on a PC to duplicate the type layer. Then I turned off the original type layer, selected the copy I just made, clicked on the menu icon in the upper corner of the layers panel and chose to convert it to a smart object. This way, I still have the original type I can reformat in the future if I wish, and begin to work with the filters I am able to return to for additional tweaks again and again as I assign them to my type set up as a smart object. Next, I went to the filter menu, dropped down to sharpen, and clicked on smart sharpen to dial in my initial settings. The type smart object layer still was not readable enough to my eye, so I duplicated that layer. Now the two layers combined were way too exaggerated, so I dropped the opacity of the new layer down to 26% and had the effect I was after. Please, if you learn nothing else from all this, take away the understanding, the appreciation that there is a difference between too little, too much, and just right. Don't be afraid to back off on an effect. In most cases, less is more. Now before we move on, Shift select the original smart object type rendering so that both layers are active. Then drop down to the well here in the layers panel and click on the little chain link icon in order to link the two layers together and maintain perfect registration between each other. This is important. One last thing to consider before exporting this multi-layered file as a JPEG for use online. I always add a copyright stamp to the work I publish on the web. I do this for several reasons, all of which I will cover in more detail in another screencast on creating a custom ID stamp for work destined for publication on the Internet. I move up to the File menu, click and drop down to Save for Web and Devices. When the window opens, I make sure that the 2-Up tab is active so that I am only comparing my soon-to-be JPEG 
to the rendering of my original above. Saving all that work built into a well-made composite photo illustration requires that the file being saved is done so at a compression setting that preserves the finest rendering of your image while avoiding too large a file size. I normally use the high setting in this dialog which generates a quality setting of 60. Now a couple of things you will notice viewing your JPEGs while working here in the Save for Web and Devices window. If you refocus your attention from your original above and the JPEG version you are previewing down below, you will notice that the JPEG gains a bit of sharpening. The compression process strips away a substantial amount of pixel data and through that operation creates a sort of faux sharpening by adding noticeable contrast. If this is a real issue for you, consider a contrast adjustment layer at the top of the layer stack in your original Photoshop file. Then bring the image back into the Save for Web and Devices dialog to reassess the quality of your image again. You will also notice that this process of converting from your layered Photoshop document to a JPEG noticeably increases your image's color vibrance and saturation. That proposed contrast adjustment layer I suggested will go a long way towards fixing that problem as well. Make sure that both the optimized and convert to sRGB boxes are checked. You need the JPEG you are about to export for use on the internet to have this color space assigned to it. In the preview options pop-up I have selected Internet Standard RGB as this shows me right here how the image will be rendered on the web. If I had instead chosen Legacy Macintosh for color management of my previews in this workspace, because I'm currently working on a Mac, I may well find myself confounded by the results later when I upload my image. By keeping the preview set to Internet Standard RGB, you are less likely to have an unwelcome surprise later online. Select Copyright and Contact Info as your preferred option in the Metadata field here, as I believe that it is critical to include this important information you should always be adding at the time you import your images into Lightroom. Save your JPEG and then upload to Facebook as your new timeline cover photo. Once again, thanks for your time. Good luck on building a series of great looking cover illustrations for your Facebook page or for the clients you work with as their social media manager.